it's going to be a really good interactive session guys so if everyone wants to turn on their camera and um, just to kind of get a feel to the room or whatever um i put my email into the chat box if anyone does have any republic work related questions you can hit me up on that or as you can connect me on linkedin whichever you prefer um so i'll pass you over to matthew now and if anyone does have any questions just let me know grant um well hello i suppose um so i'm matthew the co-founder of squid so i suppose basically when we were when we were talking about what to what to do here that there was a little bit of that i'd give more of a structured chat but then we were thinking maybe of just doing a slightly more kind of informal just um talk about all things squid basically how we got going etc and what what was involved um so i suppose to take it right back to the beginning um how we got into it in the first place was that myself and my co-founder who's called Katie we met in college so basically we were on the same scholarship program together and there basically we were under a bit of heat to maintain grades so it was a thing in UCD it was called the Ad Astra Academy for Irish people you might know it um, but it's basically meant that myself and Katie were under a lot of pressure to maintain these grades every single semester so we worked out quite quickly that we actually worked well together. Katie was very kind of detail orientated and she'd be really ridiculously good at working out every last thing to do with each subject. I was a bit more kind of broad strokes, bigger picture kind of stuff. Um, so we'd kind of mesh together in the middle and get through literally every kind of module. So we did that um, in UCD and then we did the same Erasmus over to uh, Berkeley, basically in California. Then when we were over there, I suppose that was the first time where the two of us, when we went to college, we both studied engineering, but we hadn't really a notion what we wanted to do after college. Um, and I think there was a lot of kind of external pressure as to once you jump into a degree, that's your degree. And so you should follow on with, you know, basically becoming an engineer. But then when we went over to Berkeley, it was really interesting seeing the, the cultural difference of people who were doing all these different degrees and it had no impact on their thinking whatsoever. Um, and then the second thing, which was which really occurred to us, I suppose, was just the whole startup ecosystem. Um, everyone was sort of involved or about to be involved or was setting up some form of tech startup. And, um, you know, it was just it was a mad place. You'd see everything that was kind of five years ahead of Ireland. Um, I remember one day we were walking down a road and this little robot came up beside us and it had a pizza on top of it. Um, but again, you know, people kind of looked at it once and then went back to just their normal lives. But to us, it was, you know, so futuristic kind of looking to see this sort of stuff. So we kind of got fascinated by that. And we started thinking um, of all the businesses that had been done, thinking about um, what's, what's coming into Ireland, I suppose. Um, and then what, what wasn't there. And the big thing that occurred to us that we were kind of confused by is, the big team was aggregating everything. So, you know, the likes of Airbnb, Spotify, um, putting car rentals into the one place, um, you name it. It was kind of putting everything into one app. Um, but we couldn't for the life of us understand why there wasn't an app that put all your loyalty cards in the one place. It was something that every business was using. Everyone had them, but it just seemed odd that it wasn't done. So it was kind of a niggling thought in the back of the mind, but that was kind of the initial premise. We come back to Ireland and um, we finish off masters. We're both doing the same masters. At this stage, we just kind of work together in different things in different places and different universities. So we were kind of also cracking jokes as to if we were going to do something, it would make sense to do it together. And then my uncle actually was the first person to kind of pull the, pull the trigger on it where we were talking about this thing of, um, you know, why don't we, why don't we just get into it and why don't we, why don't we do it? And then it was a Christmas dinner one um, after we'd graduated from college. This was kind of just before COVID. And he, he basically just said it. He said, why don't you? Like, what's, what's stopping you kind of thing? Do you have a job? No, basically. Um, do you have, you know, kids or whatever? No. So, you know, basically, what's your excuse kind of thing? And that was the first moment that it really hit me as to kind of like, geez, there is no, there's no reason why we shouldn't give this a go. Um, and so um, basically we got, we got going so we decided that we'd team up and we'd give this a go um, and the first thing that we did is we went out and we started talking to different businesses so we naively thought in the beginning 
all that we had to do was go around to every different business, basically ask them, can we have your loyalty card and can we stick it on an app? Done. Easy. But the more we got talking to different businesses, the more you start to realize that that's a very small part of what makes people loyal to a business. And it was much more the things that they started talking about was branding, their products, the place itself, the memories that people had. Some of them, you know, I was always blown away by people who'd kind of traveled all over the world to, to find the perfect recipe for something or the rest. Um, but I suppose really in, in simple terms, it was the passion that they had. I was kind of used to walking past all these storefronts in Dublin and Cork and the rest. Um, and then it was only when you went inside and you started talking to the owners that you realize how much effort and how much work goes into keeping one of these places alive, getting it off the ground. And it completely changes your thinking on these, on these businesses. And it turned me and Katie into little advocates for each one of these businesses. So we started, you know, going around telling everyone about how much effort the likes of um, green beards and, these sort of places that were kind of around the corner from us all our lives, how much effort they'd put in. And then we kind of clicked, right, that's, that's what makes people loyal, is knowing about the brand, knowing about the passion, knowing about all that extra stuff that, that makes the business what it is. So how can we capture that and put it into a loyalty app? We still had the basic premise that most people, they need some sort of incentive to come into a business and to buy again. So that's your kind of buy X, get one free or whatever it is. Um, but again, the more we delved into it, the more we started to realize actually the big problem there is it's way too hard for people to use these loyalty schemes. So too hard for them to sign up, too hard for them to, to kind of tap or whatever it might be, scan at a, at a supermarket or an airline or, you know, they're in too many different apps, et cetera. And then basically you get to a point where you just go, do you know what? I'm not bothered. So we found out that 60% of people um, stop using loyalty schemes after they sign up. So the interesting point that we found there was actually that it wasn't that hard to get people to join a loyalty scheme in the first place, but it was really hard to get them to come back, which is the whole point of a loyalty scheme, I suppose. So that, I suppose, brings us on to one of the first things that we were going to talk about, which was... Um, product market fit so we had a lot of advisors in the beginning and um advisors and investors etc and one of the main things that they were saying is basically just double down on nothing but getting product market fit in the beginning so product market fit i suppose i'm not going to do the best job of explaining it but i'll give it a kind of a rough um rough overview i suppose it's basically like you've identified there's a market there's a certain cohort of people or you know a market basically who have a particular problem you then come along and you think that you have the solution to the problem but nine times out of ten basically you kind of you miss you miss the the actual solution that they want um but if you can get exactly the solution that the market wants you're now in the state which is called product market fit, where basically the market knows that you've hit a bang on the head, you've solved their problem. That's of serious value to them. You can then charge for that, you can sell it basically, you can scale it through the market. And I suppose one of the telltale signs that we were told to watch out for is inbound. So basically when businesses would start coming to us and start to say, can we, can we have squid? We've heard it's good kind of stuff. Um, so that's again where back to Katie is really good at this stuff. And um, again, she kind of identified that it's about this engagement problem. If we can just make it really, really simple, and make the engagement just, just basically a one touch kind of interaction that all you need to do is take your phone out, tap to sign up, tap to engage, tap to redeem. That's it across any business that's scalable. It's simple. It's uncomplicated, uncomplicated. And um, she was able to see that before we got going, basically. So lo and behold, we launched and turns out she got it right. Um, so our engagement levels basically are, are very high. So that's kind of our, our secret sauce, I suppose, at the minute. Um, and, you know, if you compare them to other businesses in hospitality, they'd be about anywhere from three to 10 times higher than restaurant apps or other loyalty products or, you know, booking software, et cetera. Um, 
And what that meant is that we had people coming back and buying more often from different businesses, which is obviously a value of them. More, more people buying more often, there's more purchases, more money, more revenue. You can just sleep easy at night. And it's a very low cost, easy, scalable kind of promotion that you can just run in your business. So I think probably the first learning that we had is just the importance of this thing really is to, you know, if you are starting a business to really double down on getting product market fit before you do anything else, it's kind of irrelevant basically um, what you try and do. But then for us, I suppose the thing that started happening was that um, we felt like we had achieved that. And in doing so, we were kind of testing around more, trying to see, okay, well, our business is buying, um, are they asking for it? Is the inbounds growing? Are the inbounds there in the first place or are they growing? Um, and uh, the next thing that we got it into basically was trying to scale. So the reason I talk about product market fit first is I think most businesses are prone to um, looking at looking at a business and thinking the first thing they've got to do is scale rapidly. And particularly kind of US um, markets and podcasts and all the rest of it, they're always talking about like your growth rate and um, you know, how important it is to see kind of a, whatever it is, 20, 30% month on month growth. But in reality, most people, when they get started, they haven't achieved product market fit before they start scaling. So that'll just flunk at some part. You're pumping money into scaling something that no one really wants. So you're kind of forcing it down their neck. Um, so hence, get it, get it right first, basically, and then go into that. So the second thing, I suppose, that, that we started learning was the importance of um, processes. So initially you get someone in let's say at the beginning or you're, you yourself are selling something or you're building something or um you're looking after it and it all makes sense to you because you know the business inside out you've been working there since day one um and then you hire someone else to do the same to do the same thing they start to realize that it's not that easy for someone to just pick up basically where where you thought they would slot in and so a process a scalable replicable replicable process becomes the absolute cornerstone of your necessity to have before hiring basically so if you don't have something which you can clearly articulate to someone that if you want to come in and sell squid for example this is exactly how you do it you're not ready to hire you're not ready to scale basically um, but once you do have that in place, once you have product market fit, and then once you have processes that you know are scalable, um, then basically you can go ahead and you can hire for those positions. Same applies obviously for product, for customer success, for finance, et cetera, for all these different things. If it's kind of a one person show, you don't have a scalable business. You just have an unbelievable employee basically, or, or an unbelievable temp team member. So again, we started to realize that uh, what's been really important for us over the last 12 months basically is making sure that we have all our processes in place, that we basically have a system that we know that if money was to come in, we can basically hire more people into a process that means that we can reliably and predictably scale up the platform of Squid. Um, similarly, the more app users that come on, we call customer success basically for us is just looking after each business and um, the number of app users uh, per business, basically. Um, and so scaling that up and ensuring basically that there's a process, a well-defined process in place for customer success to look after those people who come in. And finally, again, for, for tech, basically, the more businesses that come on, the more load is put on the system, the more app users, the more load, the more products we build, the more load, et cetera. So every part of it needs to be scalable. It needs to be, there needs to be a process um, the data storage needs to be there, et cetera. So yeah, in terms of how we're looking at kind of scaling the business next, it's definitely been a huge part of kind of get product market fit, have the processes basically, now you're prepped to, to scale, which is kind of where we're at the beginning of this phase now, which is um, kind of exciting and fun to be honest. Um, then again, then the next part that we started getting into is as the team grew, because with each one of our processes, we would, we would kind of hypothesize them and then we would test them basically. So we thought, okay, here's the best way of selling squid um, and try and turn it into a process and go out and something would kind of break. So we need to track every single part of the process in order to work out what part was broken, basically what part needed fixing. Um, 
and then we would adopt, adapt and improve kind of stuff. Um, and so we did that, and we did that internationally as well as in Ireland. So we have places now, we're, we're now set up in over a thousand places in Ireland, the UK and Australia. Um, and again, you know, just even in that, it kind of caught up on us pretty quick that we started to realize that we were in the same sort of bracket as, you know, the flip dishes of the world. Um, we were about to join the same bracket in terms of platform sizes, sort of deliveries, your just eats, that kind of thing. Um, by a number of businesses and kind of order of magnitude type stuff. Um, and then we started to really recognize like, Jesus, we need, we need to have processes in place. We need to have all this thought through before we go into, we push into that kind of layer. We need everything kind of mapped out that we know what's going to happen at 5,000 businesses, what's going to happen at 10,000 businesses, 50,000, 100,000, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, um, we, we were saying we took on more people to, to effectively kind of test and push these things. And every person who was coming in was creating more and more value in these new processes. Because once we'd cracked a process and it becomes scalable and replicable and you can, you can define it, then you know basically that, you know, if money again comes in into that, there's, there's something which basically it will, it will work. And you're looking for more of those across the different departments. Um, which leads me on, I suppose, basically to, um, to culture and uh, sounding a little bit cynical. Initially, when, when we were starting out, I kind of thought that culture was um, a little bit of a kind of a wishy-washy word thrown around the place. Um, but then as the team started to grow, all of a sudden, you know, bam, basically, it became the most relevant thing in the company. Um, and... I suppose the way I'm looking at culture these days now is, you know, one, that if you're working in a startup, your life does become the startup, basically. Your friends are in the startup. Um, you see the people you work with all the time. And it's just so crucially important that everyone's on the same page as to, this is what we want to do, this is the amount of effort that we want to put in. Um, do we get on? Do you actually wake up in the morning and, you know, God forbid that you wake up and you don't want to come into work? Um, and recognizing, I suppose, that building a company from scratch is difficult and there's a huge amount of unknowns and for people to be okay with that, for people not to be looking for predefined, you know, as I was saying, processes, et cetera, um, that you're actually here to build them. We're here to work them out and work out the subtle changes in different markets with different products with, you know, all the rest of it. Um, and so culture basically starts becoming almost like a self-management system, basically. That if you, if you can get the culture right, if you get people, if you focus a lot on making sure that the people coming in are aligned on those things, that they, they know it's going to be hard, they know it's going to be, um, you know, uh, that the wins are going to be, I suppose, an unbelievable feeling, but the challenges are real and they're there. And there is a lot of unknowns and that can lead to a lot of chaos, I suppose, in an early stage startup. Um, but some people love that. Some people thrive in that, um, which is the group that we have at the minute, basically. Um, and so it does just make every single day kind of, you know, certainly for me, it makes it a really kind of happy experience, to be honest. You know, you wake up, you look forward to, to um, seeing the people who you're working with, um, to seeing how much we can get done in a given time frame to seeing it kind of happen and achieved. And it's just an unbelievable feeling because you're hitting all these mini milestones as a team with all these different people. Um, and as we're saying, it just means that basically when you hit a hard time, if the culture is right, it's not predicated on salary. It's not predicated on these different things, why people turn up and they work basically towards what we're doing is because we all kind of, work together as a unit we know basically that this is this is our story this is our thing that we're building um and uh one of our um investors a guy called andrew O'Shaughnessy, i was really interesting seeing it kind of at scale basically seeing um what it looked like in a company where his company just uh recently became a um unicorn um through kind of acquisitions and different stuff um but seeing a company at that scale and seeing culture played out on a level where you knew as soon as you, 
you could just feel it. It's, it's again, it's more of a feeling really, but as soon as you walk in the door and his business and pop it up, you could just feel the, the sense of happiness and kind of um, determination of everyone working together. Um, it feels kind of like walking, I don't know, into a happily family home or something like that. Um, but yeah, so again, now as we're, as we're scaling, it's, it's come, you know, the number one thing that we're looking at when we're, when we're hiring basically is, okay, we're going from a group of people who know each other really well um, and now we're gonna we're gonna seriously level up the team. Aside from making sure that they know what process, etc., they're they're being hired to do. It's just so important that they want to work in our company, that they they feel okay with it, that they you know they have a good understanding of the challenge that they're gonna face, um, but also that um, that you know that they're gonna that they're gonna thrive basically on the on the um, successes as they come and the feeling of creation and the feeling of kind of value generation and um, you know everything else that happens in between um, and then I suppose you know that 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 all kind of leads up to fundraising which is our which is our current mode at the at the minute um, and initially I was fairly um, surprised at how easy it was actually um when we kicked off i was kind of amazed that people wanted to give us money um to to you know uh because when we were coming straight out of college and stuff if anyone puts anything thousand and then once it starts getting framed in kind of billions or um the rest it's just it just feels like a huge volume of money for somebody to be saying okay here you go um, but people were going, okay, I like, I like what's happening and I want to give you the money, um, which was great. But the further you go along, the more you start to realize just how much of a process it is, how much of a full-time job basically that uh, fundraising is. And there's just so many consideration points as to what type of investor you take on, how your cap table, which is basically all your... Um, shareholders and the spread of shares in in that group um are your goals aligned basically as to what you want to happen next um and then just the sheer back and forth as to you know the amount of kind of documentation and stuff that needs to go back and forth to to kind of do due diligence and all the rest of it um and so as i was saying that's kind of that's kind of our our mode at the minute is that we've we've put a lot of work into those first three things in simple terms of kind of getting product market fit kind of early product market fit obviously um getting getting our processes in place so that we were ready to scale getting the culture right in the company so that people when they come in they'll know that they're in a business that they can work in and now it's about finding the the, the right investors and so you know we're, we're at a stage at the minute where there's a lot of people who um are interested basically so it's a, it's a nice position to be in that we can kind of talk to lots of different people and pick you know kind of okay well this person aligns better or this fund aligns better with what we're trying to do etc um but then yeah it's kind of it's just interesting to see again all the differences as to if this group's in the uk and this one's american and this one's irish and they all have different interests and um, thought processes and stuff and it's nowhere near as simple as people just basically kind of going okay well here's money basically and we want you to make a return um, particularly for an early stage venture so um, yeah a huge amount of it as I was saying like now is kind of meeting just lots of people um, telling our story focusing them basically on this is where we want to go and is that something of interest to you um, and looking at people Again, you know, Ireland's a, an unbelievable place to get started in this with um, just the sheer breadth of experience and knowledge and connection and network that Ireland has. Um, it's an amazing kind of seed ground, I suppose, um, for, for us to get started in. And, you know, obviously, again, for, for myself and Katie coming out of um, college, getting into this in the first place, you know, what, what we, we knew nothing. We still have you know, God knows how much to learn and every day you're learning more and more stuff. And um, to find again the right uh, 
investors who become mentors um, who basically teach things into the company and they, they add so much more value than just money, especially when you get the right people. And we've been incredibly fortunate to date that our investors are kind of, you know, they've been so supportive. They've been taught us so much. They've opened up so many doors. Um, and that's exactly the kind of people that we want to work with going, going forward again. And to keep learning and to keep expanding them, that network, basically, of, of people who can teach us new things. Um, so, sorry, that was, that was kind of a, a long enough rant there that I kind of just went on as to, as to different things. But, um, yeah, basically, I suppose it's been, it's been great. Um, and again, for, for people who are kind of looking at starting a business in, in Ireland or getting involved, it honestly is just the best place to do it. I've talked to a lot of people in different countries. And the real thing that I keep on getting shocked by is how um, helpful everyone is. I, I cannot believe genuinely every single time as to the generosity and the, the openness of people to talk to early stage founders, people, people like us, um, and, and kind of help, you know, pass on their learnings, their teachings, make introductions, um, all the rest of it is just a it's just a fantastic place and yeah again places like Republic of Work or Dog Patch where we where we're working they're unbelievable ecosystems to to kind of get all this get all this started so it's a it's fun basically in short and it's a it's kind of exciting time I suppose for for us to be getting all this up and going and pushing on um yeah sorry sorry that was kind of a bit of a rant <laughs> No, at all, Matthew. That was great. Very passionate. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions for Matthew, guys? Um, you can unmute or pop them in the chat box if you like. Um, I also just popped a short little survey in there, guys. If you could fill it out, um, I'd be really appreciative. It's just to keep our lunch and learns as informative as possible. Um, and you can get some free day passes out of it as well. Um, so that's always good. Um. Can you just say that it was really, it was really interesting, uh, Matthew, and uh, appreciate you sharing the story and the insights as well. Um, if if you don't mind, after I might just grab you just to ask you something else. If that's okay, would you just hang on for for a minute? Absolutely. Thanks, Minnie. Cool. Um, does anyone else have any other questions, guys? Um, I think you might be off the hook for today. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, well, thanks so much for everyone to, for attending today and um, I'll see you next week, as always. Great. Thanks, Millie, guys. I did ask a question, but I don't think you heard it, Matty, actually. Oh, sorry, you might have been on mute. That's good. No, I typed it in, actually. I, I thought it would be more... So, you know, okay. um, oh, what you were saying about the whole culture side was really interesting, you know, and it's, it's very topical right now in my startup. And... Um, you know, how that ties into your, your whole hiring process, because it seems you're doing an amazing job of hiring fantastic people. And uh, I'm wondering how you, you know, how you do that. How does that work? Um, well, I suppose the first thing to say is genuinely that, the, you know, that the, um, the, peop the people that we do have are, are more heavily involved, I would say, as to, as to initiating that, that hiring process and um, adding to the culture themselves. So it's definitely... You know, there is me and Katie, but then the wider team, they, they're they hugely formative in what the culture is and what they're looking for and the kind of values that they want, et cetera. Um, but um, to be honest with you, again, a lot of it was kind of iterations, I suppose. So, um, you know, the first time we put up a job posting, we were we were kind of blown away by, we, we, had, uh, we had great reception. We, had, we, had, um, we put up one sales job and, we had about 2,000 applicants in two days or something. Um, so we kind of thought, oh, this is going to be easy. Um, all you do is you put up job applications and then you kind of filter through them. Um, but I suppose the more, the more, we've, the more we've learned, it's way less to do with just number of applicants and it's to do with kind of how you, how you screen different people, um, both as to kind of aptitude, which is sort of, you know, you're, you're, I suppose for us, it's more the, that's sort of the bare... Um, prerequisites I suppose of kind of getting to the first stage but then it's um, 
it's it's what the interview process looks like and for us um it'll be initially some sort of um some sort of kind of task basically and um the re the reason why we do this and you know this is this is um probably fairly obvious as well to the people who are hiring but it's to screen actual interest so you know we put out something and then if people um genuinely want to work there they'll do the task but if they just start hitting easy apply on everything or whatever um it screens out those people i suppose um then we'll get into kind of you know we'll assess that again and then we'll get into more of a call on um basically talking through some set questions as to why they want to work there the type of person that they are basically trying to push their personality to the to the front um and also kind of a, again um you know depending on what the what the job description is a, a kind of an in-person task so um if it's software more of a kind of a, a coding type um environment and if it's sales almost just looking at our website and basically saying can you can you pitch squid to us can you sell why somebody should should join um and then what we what we'll do at the end is we'll bring in um on a final call so again we're making it a bit tedious but slightly deliberately again just to actually work it you know it, it is a big deal starting a job and um i think the people should approach it that way um but the final thing then we'll do is we'll bring in uh, people from other departments uh to to again ask kind of similar questions and you, you almost chemistry kind of screening really um but they'll be they'll be looking for certain things um and they'll be looking for you know green flags red flags anything like that basically um and you know so if you have a salesperson to get them talking with somebody who's already working in, in um product let's say and see how they interact and see um are they kind of aligned etc um because at the end of the day as we're saying it's, it's all about this kind of together um um that if everyone knows that um they're all working together and we're we're big on um share options as well so everyone who comes in if you're in sales you have to know the importance of product and customer success and finance and legal because the sum of all of it basically is what is what furthers the company which is furthering your shares which is furthering you so you know for people again to to kind of have that feeling is is very important so again sorry that's a that's a kind of long-winded um that's a sort of a long-winded thing to that again yeah and um have you noticed that, uh, could you, i think you started pre-covid did you yes just pre-covid exactly yeah yeah so um uh so maybe you were kind of uh, in, the, in the same working environment while they're working remotely it's um it's i think it's it's kind of a like a different animal now with the whole remote working it, 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 to, in keeping the culture right how do you how do you do that it, it, exactly so we were we were quite uh um to be honest there was definitely an element of luck just as to kind of the initial people who came into the company were um just ridiculously you know one one person in particular comes to mind um ella um who's been working with us and she was she was fantastic as to kind of just um you know focusing outside of just the kind of the day to day and checking in on people and asking how they are and kind of uh, because it was you know it's it's hard to remember i suppose now but if you remember at the very very beginning how isolating and how lonely i suppose a lot of the the complete lockdown at the be beginning was um and i think it was in that kind of early stages the people kind of buy more into you know this isn't just tasks this is more of a friend group more of becoming almost more of a kind of a unit if you know what i mean and that we um that uh it was kind of the the longer calls where we would um just talk about kind of future future ambitions what it could all become we'd literally set up with you know um a pint or something like that a lot of the time and kind of just chat away talk about those kind of things um but it is it is difficult in um in the covid times and we definitely we definitely thought that a uh, um anything group wise didn't work for us which was which was quite difficult so we tried to do more one on one things getting people to just have a chat more one on one because well as you kind of you, you I know um Ali you've obviously um been very successful in a number of different things so you'd know we're kind of big groups on zoom um 
you know, people just looking at each other. It's not like a normal human interaction where you can turn left and right to the person next door. So somebody wants to make a point socially on Zoom, you can only have one conversation, if you know what I mean. You can't, you can't have multiple little conversations. So it just, it just doesn't work, is what we found. So we just did loads of kind of smaller, um, smaller things. And then when we could um, meet up, there was definitely a sense of, excitement and anticipation to see people, I suppose, and to kind of, um, to enjoy whatever it was, you know, dinner, pints, just going for a walk, whatever, whatever it might be kind of stuff. Um, but it's only, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, basically, I think. Yeah, it's new territory for, for everyone, I suppose, yeah. I'm trying to get everyone, get people to come back in the office now, and struggling, actually. <laughs> it's not politically correct to ask people to come back, you know. But did you, did you, have you kind of gone through that? Have you tried to get people to come back to an office? Yeah, we, we, we just had a new um, CTO join and he, he came up with a brilliant idea, which worked really well in our last um, meetup, which was to run a internal hackathon, basically, um, which we did for just a really short amount of time. It was basically like a three hour thing. And what we were looking at was features potential features that we could build that we'd already kind of dis discussed so they were um they were they were of real business value it wasn't kind of just talk about you know uh, anything and everything um but when we we did it kind of with um prizes etc at the end and we just made sure that when people came in we were mixing up the okay these guys have been here you know for over a year let's say and these guys are a week into the company so we'll mix up the teams um that way we'll each give someone um a, a potential feature they'll go away they'll talk through it they really do start to get to know each other um and then we kind of force as well the other way of you know trying to get the the newer people to present it or to do whatever and um so i think kind of maybe smaller collaborative things like that that again mix departments and mix um uh you know for one um people who've been there basically for a long time with people who've just kind of come in um that works really well as to as to getting you know again a sense of kind of um camaraderie i suppose and togetherness in, in the company so far yeah thanks it's interesting oh we can't hear you there albert Am I all right now? You're good now. <laughs> all right, thanks. So uh, somebody had to do it. Um, th thanks, Matthew. Thanks for sharing. Um, I, we, I think a lot of us have been following um, your success for, for a while. It's been great to see. Um, really enjoy it. Um, but like, um, we're at a position now, I guess, that you guys might have come across as well, where we're trying to, we're kind of about to launch, really get, we're kind of half launched. And, and I guess... They say to get your product out there before it's like it's never 100% right out the gate, you know. Um, so you met, you mentioned um, Irish businesses have been very successful and I, I found that to be true as, or to, to be very um, helpful and I found that to be true as well. But um, so what was your experience at the start getting the product out there? I suppose when it's kind of a half live environment and you, you probably had a few hiccups along the way. Um, exactly um so i i suppose the first thing that we did which again is um it, it, you know um we possibly got lucky i suppose for want of a better phrase but uh was that we we just really enjoyed talking to the people who were going to use the product so we just spent days and days and days talking to we we initially decided we were going to launch in kind of um with sort of stamp cards and then move up the ladder into kind of um, bigger retail into, you know, uh, points-based schemes, et cetera. But so when we were thinking stamp cards, who's that to our head, we were going, oh, it's kind of coffee shops and that sort of thing. So we spent ages and ages just talking to people who worked in coffee shops um, and um, focusing on trying to get them to open up, I suppose, basically as to like, what is the, what's, the problem what are the hardships on a day-to-day -day? what's it like what's um what does running a coffee shop feel like have you ever done it before somewhere else is it different in a different place we were talking to these guys and they said it was different and 
the, you know, the more you're kind of um, gaining more knowledge, I suppose, on the market, on the problem. Um, and, and on the back of that, um, when, when you're launching a product, I suppose you have assumptions that you're making. Um, and, and to basically try and articulate those assumptions um, and then to, as the more information that you gather, you can test the assumptions. So you can either just do it by collecting kind of information and testing against that, or literally the best way I found is kind of, you know, we would do mock-ups and stuff and we would sort of say, this is what we're looking at. What do you think? Um, and then just hand it to someone and then let them kind of go, uh, oh, I don't, you know, I don't really know about that or I, I like this part. Um, and it kind of becomes a sample size market researchy type problem. Um, but you can go very far on an, on an MVP, I think. Um, especially with the likes of, um, we, we use a thing called Figma, for example, where we can just mock up different stuff kind of quickly and, and show it to people and see what they, even what they think is going to happen. You know, if you, if you like hand it to them and see what they try and kind of tap or see what they do. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so it's, uh, I, I'd say the number one thing basically is just talking to whoever the customer base is. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Good. No. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Amir. Okay, cool. I think that might have been our last question of the day. Um, so thanks so much again to Matthew um, for your time. It was really great, really informative. Um, and as usual, there's another lunch in there next week. And <laughs> so hopefully I'll see some familiar faces again. Um, so thanks again, Matthew, for today. And this recording will be available on YouTube as well in the coming days. So if anyone does want to recap over some of the points that Matthew made, um, you'll be able to do so there. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks a million, guys. Thanks very much for having me on.